Are you giving the best of everything in your life to Christ? The best of your gifts, your time, your money? If not, perhaps we need to ask ourselves this morning, why, why aren't we giving God our best in all areas of our life? And today we're going to be continuing on where we began last week in the book of John as we continue to look at the life of Jesus as we move towards Easter in the coming weeks as a congregation together. And thinking of those questions that I asked, this morning we will hear the account of Mary uh, who lived in full devotion to Christ and who was willing to sacrifice greatly for Him in many different areas of her life. So last week, if you were here or not here, we began our series. Uh, Pastor Tony led us through John chapter 11, uh, verses 17 to 44, as the account was looked at of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, as Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. We heard about Jesus being with Mary, with Martha, and with Lazarus, and Jesus performing this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, and also, as he said, the last I am statement, which you see in the book of John, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then in the verses following uh, what we looked at last week, it talks about the Pharisees and the chief priests who meet to discuss what to do about this Jesus, the issues that he was causing them, and desiring to arrest him and kill him whenever they would find him next. So as the days pass, uh, in this time that we're looking at, Passover continues to draw nearer. And it would be the last Passover that Jesus would partake in with his disciples while on the earth. And if you don't know, this event of Passover was the remembrance of the salvation that God granted to Israel while they were exiles in Egypt, that you can see in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, when the angel of death passed over the Israelite homes because of the blood of the Passover lamb that was on their doorpost to protect them. You could preach a whole sermon on that. I have actually preached on that before, but uh, we're looking at John chapter 12 this morning. But Jesus knew that as he drew closer to the celebration of Passover, he was following the path that would lead to the cross, that would lead to his death and then his resurrection. And yet, even with knowing all the pain and suffering that would come, we see Jesus' perfect obedience through this whole time, leading to that Easter, leading to his sacrifice on the cross. And as mentioned before, because of the raising of Lazarus, because of this miracle that was performed, uh, many Jews believed in Jesus. They saw what happened and, and they believed in him. So this led to these Jewish leaders wanting to kill him because they were jealous of him. And they knew that as the time passed, many more would continue to believe in what they called the blasphemer, Jesus. And they were worried about mostly losing their power. That Most of all, that was what they were concerned with, was that they would lose the power that they had over the people. So because of these things, uh, it says in verse 54 of chapter 11 in the book of John, if you haven't opened there, I... Uh, ask you to turn to John chapter 11 and 12. But in verse 54, it said, because that they were looking to kill him, it says that Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. So he went instead to a town called Ephraim, which it says there in, in chapter 11, and stayed there with the disciples. And in the, a couple of verses there to follow, it says that many were traveling to Jerusalem in preparation for this Passover feast to celebrate together. And they would take time before the feast to purify themselves so that they could take part. But Jesus was nowhere to be found. And they were surprised because they thought that he would be there to take part in Passover. So they began to wonder if he would even show up there at all. So out of this situation where many are in Jerusalem, Jesus had been in Ephraim, we come uh, to John chapter 12, verse 1, which we're going to be reading chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, and looking at these verses this morning. So read with me there from John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. 
But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. So these verses that we focus on this morning, right at the beginning it says that it is six days until Passover. What we mentioned before, the Passover feast that would take place in Jerusalem. So the day was likely the Saturday before Passover, as the feast would begin Friday evening at sundown of the following week. And as mentioned, uh, Jesus had been in Bethany, which was where Lazarus and Mary and Martha were living. Then he had traveled uh, to Ephraim. And now we see once again they return to Bethany to be with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha once again. Like I said before, there were people in Jerusalem looking to arrest Jesus. So therefore, that word is said because of this, because he, it was not his time for him to be arrested yet, he went instead to Bethany instead of Jerusalem because it was not time for his arrest and crucifixion yet. It would be to come. So again, Jesus and his disciples are there with Mary, with Martha, and Lazarus. This Lazarus who had just been raised from the dead, who is now alive. It's hard to imagine being put in that situation. Imagine being one of those disciples that they had just gone with Jesus. This man was in the tomb, had been just raised from the dead, out of these messy clothes, whatever he was wearing, the cloths, and now they're sitting with him sharing a meal it's just hard to even put yourself in their shoes. Imagine what they were going through. But now they're sharing a meal with him just days after he had been dead in the grave. So it says that Martha was serving the meal. And that, again, that Lazarus was there partaking and reclining at the table. But the focus of this passage here is really on Mary. For in verse 3, we hear what Mary had done for Jesus. That she takes a pound... Or when I look, it says in my Bible that it was a, a liter, a Roman pound, a litra, equal to about 11.5 ounces of expensive ointment and perfume uh, made from pure nard, it says. That she takes it and anoints the feet of Jesus with it, then wipes his feet with her hair. So it's important that as we look at this verse, consider the significance of it, that we understand some of the details from this verse. The first thing to consider is that this was a very large amount of perfume or ointment. And it says it was made from pure nard, which was something that would be imported from India and was normally used by the Romans for anointing the head. And also it says in this verse that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. But if you look at the parallel accounts in both Matthew 26 and Mark 14, which contain the same story, it says the perfume was poured on his head. So with these different three accounts in mind, it's likely that he poured, she poured the ointment on his head and his feet as well. It's also important to realize that attending to another's feet was normally the work of a servant, for they were dirty as they walked many far distances and wore sandals. So attending to the feet would be the work of a servant. So Mary, by performing this act of attending to his feet, shows both humility, that she didn't really care about herself being put in the place of a servant, and shows her devotion to Jesus by, be willing, by being willing to do this. And also, it says that she wiped his feet with her hair. And this would be highly unusual as well. For Jewish women rarely would unbound their hair in public. So by willing to do this, it shows that she didn't really care about what people thought or what tradition was, but she wanted to show her intense personal devotion to Christ. So while this is only one verse out of this passage that describes the actions of Mary, there are many interesting details that we've looked at that show Mary's intentions. And it's important to ask ourselves, what can we take from this example given by Mary of how she looked to Jesus? For we see by her actions, we see someone that is totally focused on Christ. As I said, she was not concerned about how she looked. 
She was not worried about how she was perceived. She was not worried about what others thought of her actions. But by what she did, she displayed her humility and her devotion to Christ. So as we think of this, how would our lives look if we lived this way? If our eyes were so fixed on Jesus that we didn't care what others thought of us, that we didn't care what they, was said about us, that we didn't care how our actions were perceived, I imagine that our lives would look quite different. Perhaps we would see the needs of others above our own. Perhaps we would spend more time with Jesus and less on our own concerns, less our own hobbies and whatever else we have going on. Perhaps our budget, our spending, our giving habits would look differently than they do. For Mary, from her actions, shows that she was willing to sacrifice financially to give up something that was very costly, that she was willing to sacrifice her status, as I said, cleaning his feet and taking the very place of a servant, that she was willing to do something that a Jewish woman would rarely do, not thinking of how it would appear to others. So we need to ask ourselves, are we giving God our best? As I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, are we giving Him the best of our finances? Are we giving Him the best of our time? Are we giving Him the best of our gifts and all these things that He blesses us with? And from the new, the new Daily Study Bible, William Barclay has to say about this verse from Mary's actions. He says, We see love's extravagance. For Mary took the most precious thing she possessed and spent it all on Jesus. And love is not love if it nicely calculates the cost. Love gives its all, and its only regret is that it has not still more to give. Love gives its all, and its only regret is that it has not still more to give. I think of a speaker at a conference I heard when I was younger at a men's conference. He talked about, um, as he had came to follow Christ, Christ, Jesus challenged him with his uh, finances and his giving. And he said that he had been giving so much that every year he submitted his taxes, he got audited because they said it's not possible for someone making what he did to give as much as he did. And just thinking of that example, that's the challenge for us. What would people think this of us? We want to be, are, are we seen as a giving people in our lives? I think of another friend in Bible college. Uh, baseball was his favorite thing to do, to watch. He loved watching the Blue Jays games every day. Uh, but he felt challenged by the Lord of his love for baseball, that it was coming ahead of his time with God. So he took the first 15, 30, however many minutes at the beginning of each game when he wanted to go and sit down and watch the baseball game. And he took that time, his precious time of wanting to watch baseball, and dedicated it to the Lord to read his Bible, to pray, to take that time that was special to him, and instead give it to God. So we can ask ourselves, are we giving with our time? Are we giving with the time that God blesses us with each day? So for us, we need to consider what God is calling us to. As we've been going through the book of Romans with the youth group uh, the last couple weeks, we've been, I've been challenging them about how, we're, how they are spending time with the Lord. To find the things that they enjoy to do. So that it, when it comes to spending time with God, it doesn't feel like a chore, but it's something that you actually want to do, that you look forward to, that you enjoy doing. So I think the same for us. I mean, many of us have been in the church for many years, but there's still time for us to find the ways that we enjoy serving. Find the things that God has gifted you in and do these things. For some, it's the way that you serve others. Some like reading. Some prefer an audio Bible. Some prefer to pray in quiet. Some out loud. Some prefer to write down their prayers. Some prefer to sit down in a quiet, dark room to spend time with the Lord. Some prefer to be out in nature. We need to realize that we're all different. We all have different gifts. We all have different talents. We all have different likes and dislikes. And we can celebrate these things. But we should also use these things for our Lord and consider how can we serve Him with the ways that He's blessed us? How can we give sacrificially of our lives not only of our finances, but our time and our gifts. And how can we live our lives for Jesus, unconcerned by how people will look at us from the outside? So may we think of Mary, who fell at Jesus' feet in worship, anointing Him with this perfume, being with Him, 
desiring to be near him and to worship her Lord. And then but immediately following the account of Mary in verse 3, we hear of one who was there who shares his thoughts on what had happened. It was Judas Iscariot chimes in and he says, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? For it was a large amount of money that this was worth and it, it could have been given to the poor. And it does sound like his intentions were pure at first. But really, as it says, he says this because he wanted the money for himself to be able to help and uh, take it out of the money bag that he looked after. So considering this, we can look at our own lives and say, when we truly seek Christ, especially when we want to seek Him in a deeper way than we ever have before, we will face opposition. That is a reality. That is a promise. We have never been promised a life without trouble as Christians. We need to realize that and recognize that, that we will face opposition. And this can be opposition from other people. This could be spiritual opposition. Or it could come in other ways, but we should not be surprised. Perhaps it would be someone questioning why we give money to our church or why we give money to other organizations. Perhaps it would be someone asking why you would choose to waste your time volunteering for a church event or even going to church when you could take time for yourself. For me, I know what I've heard from certain people, even in my own family, it could be asking why would I choose to be a pastor when I could make much more money doing something else? Why would you make that choice? But the point is that there will always be those trying to discourage us. That, as I said, we will face opposition, but this should not deter us. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus and what He has for us, what He is calling us to. Considering how we can live a sacrificial life, being willing to serve wherever we are called to serve. And then we come to verse 7 in this uh, short passage here, where it says, in my translation it says, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. When reading it in my translation, it seemed confusing because why would it say that he's, she's keeping it for the day of his burial when she had already used the ointment? So to help understand it, I looked uh, in some other translations. And some of you may have these translations already, but I just want to read from three different translations to help understand this verse. So in the NIV translation, verse 7 says, Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. In the NLT translation, it says, Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. And in the HCSB, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it says, Jesus answered, leave her alone, for she has kept it for the day of my burial. And then, as I mentioned before, there's also the parallel references in both Matthew and Mark's Gospels, which can help us understand this verse as well. In Matthew 26, verse 12, it says, In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. And then in Mark 14, verse 8, it says, She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. So considering all these things, it helps to make a little bit more sense, both that Jesus obviously recognized that he would be on the cross and die and be buried soon without Mary knowing it, without the disciples knowing it, but he knew what was to come, and he knew that in doing this now, she was already helping him to prepare the body for burial. And in the Pillar New Testament commentary, D.A. Carson says with regards to this verse, there is no clear evidence that Mary or anyone understood before the cross that Jesus had to die. She meant this simply to be an act of costly, humble devotion. But, like Caiaphas, who uh, you'll see uh, previously in verse 11, or chapter 11, she signaled more than she knew by what she did. In the culture of the day, it was not thought inappropriate to spend lavish sums at a funeral, including the cost of the perfumes that were designed to stifle the smell of decay. But here was Mary, lavishingly pouring her perfume on Jesus while he was yet alive. 
So she probably didn't recognize the significance of what she was doing, really, preparing him for burial with these, this perfume, this expensive perfume, while he was still alive, but not knowing what would be to come. But Jesus knew the significance. Jesus knew what was to come, and therefore he told the others to leave her alone, for they would too soon understand the significance of what she was doing, for they would soon see him buried in the grave. So then we come to the last verse, verse 8. And it's important to understand that, as Jesus said, For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. By saying that, he was not saying that you shouldn't help the poor. Rather, he alludes uh, alludes to a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 15, where in this verse it is said that they should always be open to helping those in need, for there will always be around those that are in need. So they should be open to helping them. Again, Barclay in the New Daily Study Bible says, To help the poor was something that could be done any time. But to show the heart's devotion to Jesus had to be done before the cross on Calvary took him to its cruel arms. So let us remember to do things now, for the chance so often never comes again, and the failure to do them, especially the failure to express love, brings bitter remorse. So we see Mary with her actions. There's not really much explained about what she was doing, her reasoning for what she did. But simply she wanted to give to Jesus. She wanted to be with him. She wanted to give sacrificially something that was difficult for her, something that was expensive, but she considered it worthwhile to do. But again, Jesus knew what they did not. That he would only be there for a short while longer. So Mary should not be punished for her actions, as Judas suggested. Rather, she should be celebrated for her dedication to her Savior. And if you look at the verses to follow uh, from verses 9 to 11, you will see after that not only were the chief priests looking to kill Jesus for this miracle that he performed and for those that were choosing to follow him, but now they were looking to kill Lazarus as well. For just from people hearing that this dead man was now living, from people seeing Lazarus and seeing him walking alive, people were coming to believe in Jesus just from seeing Lazarus. And again, these people, the high priests, the Pharisees, they were desperate to not give up their control and their power over the people. So as we leave this passage this morning, and as we continue in the coming weeks to move towards Easter, we should consider this example of Mary that we looked at this morning and consider our own lives and ask ourselves, are we also giving Jesus our best? As I said, are we giving him the best of our everything, of our time, our money, our gifts, everything that we have to offer? We need to ask ourselves, are we totally devoted to Jesus? Also, we can ask ourselves, are we more concerned by how Jesus sees us than how others see us? And finally, considering these questions and how we answered ourselves, we can ask ourselves, what steps can we practically take to shift our focus from earthly things and on to Jesus as we approach the time of Easter and we remember his life, his death, and his resurrection. So I pray that we would consider these things as we move from here today. So let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for who you are, Lord. We thank you for Easter, for the time that is coming that we can set aside to Remember the sacrifice that you paid, Lord, your death and your burial, but then your resurrection and and the victory that we have because of your resurrection, your victory over sin and death, Lord, that we can share in that as well, Lord. And we thank you for the biblical examples of those who were totally devoted to you, Lord. For Mary, who gave sacrificially of all that she had, not considering what she had to lose, but what she had to gain by worshiping you, Lord, and celebrating you. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final song.